Thank you. So I'd like you all to imagine that you're maybe in your hotel bar of an evening and you see someone sitting in the bar wearing a hat like this. And maybe you come to certain conclusions about this individual, make certain assumptions, develop certain expectations. And as you retire to bed for the evening, this individual wishes you good night. And they happen to pronounce it with, let's say, a monophthongal realization of the vowel good night. I didn't do a very good job of that being from the south, which is, um, which is meant to be the implication. So that's possibly in line with your expectations. Now let's imagine that regardless of where you're from and what your normal accent is, that you reply and offer the same thing back, and you also pronounce it with this monophthongal realization of I. So this is something quite familiar. This is kind of convergence that we're all hopefully somewhat familiar with, both from knowing about language and also being language users. And there's a number of um, examples of this in literature, this kind of phonetic um, convergence. There's an example I remember from about 20 years ago, watching uh, TV, and Gianni Versace had recently been murdered, and a French um, journalist um, asked Elton John about this. He said, uh, how do you feel uh, Elton John about the death of Gianni Versace? And Elton John replied, well, it is difficult to say. <laughs> this, this was not a time for levity. <laughs> this was, uh, this was, um, yeah, this was clearly not a joke that Elton John was mm. making. This was something that he, without really intending it, did. And you may or may or, or not may not have had personal experience of um, this. People seem to vary in the extent that they do this. Let's imagine a slightly different case. Let's imagine you see this person wearing a hat by the bar, and they don't actually say anything to you, but you've developed these expectations about them, and regardless of where you're from, you wish them good night with this monophthongal um, realization of the um, vowel. So we, there's some evidence of this in the literature as well, where people converge not to what they've heard other people say, but what they kind of expect that they might say. So. There's an example here of an Anglo interviewer speaking to a Maori guy, and he used the A tag quite a lot. And this is stereotypically a feature of um, how Ma Maori men um, speak in New Zealand. Now, what's interesting about this was this is not a typical feature of the interviewer's speech, and it wasn't a feature that the Maori interviewee ever used during the uh, conversation. And there's also work from my uh, collaborator, Lacey Wade, where, uh, where she found that speakers produce more monophthongal I when they're supposed to a southern talker, even if that uh, southern talker never produces that. In fact, never produces the uh, variable at all, let alone the particular variant. So this is really about, question about social meaning, the broad question here. It's about how does social meaning shape linguistic form, but also about well, how are social linguistic targets constructed? How do we develop this idea about who this individual is that we're talking to, who the audience is, what the target is that we are converging to, regardless of whether we think we're doing this? You know, break this down into four Oh, and we can also, sorry, before we get to that, we can also imagine yet another case where we wish this individual good night with this uh, southern realization of the vowel, and then they reply back, but they reply back to something completely unexpected, like good night. What do we do then? How do we respond to that? So we put this down into sort of four questions that we were interested in in this study. The first is, well, do speakers converge to expected but unobserved linguistic behavior, as in uh, this example? Second, do speakers converge to observe linguistic behavior in the absence of social linguistic expectations? You need those expectations to be there before you do this convergence. We have to imagine a situation like this. I mean, I personally don't have strong expectations about how someone wearing a hat like that's going to speak. Maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe there may be uh, stereotypes that I'm unaware of. Um, so what would happen if someone had like that, use that feature and you had no other reason to expect it, would you converge in the same way? Like this, for instance. And what, what happens if the two 
align. So if observation confirms expectation, you have a boosting effect that leads then more likely to, to um, converge to a greater extent. Finally, what happens if observation contradicts expectation? Mm -hmm. example, before. So to study this experimentally, the ideally we need a task which is interactive. We want this to be a task where people really interact with individuals rather than with screen says that they're so we should expect to see some convergence. We should expect this to be an environment in which convergence should happen somewhat naturally. But we also, potentially at odds with this, want to manipulate both observed and expected behavior. And also control for the social linguistic experience that people bring to the lab, at least as far as we can. So I hope you'll agree the only real option is an inductive experiment in which participants take on the guise of aliens and do a math test using <laughs> alien language. Now, <laughs> I might be overselling this, but hopefully you'll see that there are advantages to this um, approach. And this is what we um, essentially did. So this is an experiment. We recruited about, um, I think, 120 participants, and they participated in pairs. Some of them, a minority of them, participated in the lab. We separate cubicles and so on, they, didn't, they weren't um, directly facing each other or anything like that. The majority of the participants were actually recruited online, um, whether from the small number of them from the uh, pen subject pool participated online, the majority um, recruited by a prolific academic. In any case, we had a pair of participants, but we let them believe and strongly imply that actually they were participating as parts of somewhat larger groups of participants. So the first thing that happened if you were a participant in this experiment was that you were assigned to an alien species. You're introduced to the Volbeans and the Rebits, <laughs> and you were assigned to one of these two species. In this case, you're a Volbean. Congratulations. <laughs> but you were aware that there were some other aliens of a different species, looked a bit different, different name. And the task <coughs> was a map task. So you had like they both acted as director and matched with different um, maps. Um, and you had the director, the leader, if you like, would have a um, I have this would have this path on the map, and they had to <coughs> tell the follower who had an identical map what path to trace on their map. And as the follower <coughs> traced, the, traced this path on their map, this would appear in real time for the director of the maps, as they were identical. And they did this, many of the people were in completely different places, they were typing <coughs> messages to each other on instant messaging um, software, using, as I said, an alien language which looked a bit like this. This is the Grebit um, dialect, and here is the other dialect, the Balbine dialect. So you'll notice um, in particular that when you have P's in this dialect, you have F's in this dialect. So you would be assigned to an alien, you learn about what task was, you'd learn this language, you didn't get to refer to this while you were doing the map task, but had a bit of time teaching it to you. And we gave some information to one of the participants. We'd say, well, full beans may speak a slightly different dialect and use F in place of P. So we'll call this the explicit expectation participant, and we'll call the other one the no expectation participant. Of course they had expectations, they expected paid, they expected various <laughs> things, but they didn't have an explicit expectation about the other dialect. So every pair went through this experiment in three counterbalanced phases. And I'll talk through these one by one. So bear in mind I'm going to talk to them in a particular order, but they were counterbalanced. Uh, there was the same species phase, the match other species phase, the unmatched other species phase. And these are really named from the perspective of the um, explicit expectation participant. They didn't hear the names of these, but um, you'll understand why they're named this way in a moment. So for the same species phase, it worked like this. We have two participants, and we tell one of them your partner is rebits like you. Of course, they have an expectation about how rebits speak. And then for no expectation participant, we say, your partners agree, they don't have a strong expectation, perhaps they expect the dialect to be the same, depends on whether they've encountered agreements before. Um, so, in this case, both participants expecting the same species, and we made sure that what they got was in line with the dialect that species had been taught. 
So if one participant typed an F, this participant, for instance, the server would record this and then spit out a peek for the other participants. <laughs> so we controlled what the participants actually observed, regardless of what they typed in. Now consider the match other species phase. So in this phase, we have for the, the no expectation participant is told again, your partner's agreed it, and they're actually told it's a different rebit. The explicit expectation participant is told this time your partner's a bulbine. So they have an expectation of what they might hear, see. And this time again, the server is making sure that what they observe is in line with the um, cognition, the phase. So this is the match of the species phase. You have another species, and what you see is matched with what you should probably expect. Then we have the unmatched other species phase, where again the no expectation participants told your partner will agree with it, and again, like in the matched other species phase, the explicit expectation participant is told your partner is a bulb bean, an expectation. This time, however, while this participant again gets this P as they have become used to, possibly, if this is later on in the game, in this case we give them something different. The explicit expectation participant has expectation with F is going to get a V, something a little bit different. And I should say that, remember, these are counterbalanced, so because V could, in principle, occur in other phases, we also change that into what we wanted the participants to observe. So in three phases, and we're controlling what at least one participant expects, and also controlling what the participants observe. So what do we see? Well, first of all, do we see this convergence to expected behavior? And this is a question only for the no expectation participant who had explicit expectations. So this is what we see. So this is on the y-axis you can see the amount that the um, explicit expectation participant is, learning, is using F, which is not the letter that they were taught in their diet. As you would expect, in the same species condition where they're talking to someone else and they don't expect or see using F, they don't very much. In the match and unmatched phases, however, in the other species, we should be see this use of F. So we see getting up to about 25% um, convergence on this uh, variant. How about if you don't have any expectations? How about the no expectation participant? So here, we don't, the condition phase names don't really make so much sense. So here we can look at what happened in each phase going along. So along the what X axis, we just have first, second, third phase whatever that might be for the other participants, and we have P usage along here. So we see here that expectation isn't really playing the same kind of role, and we see what happens as they encounter these P's, and over time we get a nice, fairly steady increase in the use of P, converging with the rebix they've started encountering. Even though they're led to believe this is a different um, rebix instead. So what happens when, let's look at what the expectation participants, the explicit expectation participants do with the observed behavior. So here we have, on the y-axis, we have the observed variant. How much are they using the, the um, thing that they actually saw rather than what they expected? Might have been the same as here, uh, wasn't the same here. So for the same species condition, it's basically the 100%, which is not unexpected. Expect P, they see P, same species, no problem. For the match and match condition, though, we get, first of all, for the match condition, whether expecting F and uh, getting F, we see this kind of converting to close to 25%. For the unmatched condition, we're also seeing this use of the observed variant that they weren't expecting. It's a lot smaller, so the rate is lower, but they're using it. They're starting to adopt this form. But what, let's look at these things together. So we actually measured, we set this up so that we could measure what the participants said before they encountered anything from their partner. So we look at what happens um, over time, before they've heard AC and after they've heard it. So we see here, first of all, the same species, not much happens, not much changes. In the match condition, where they're expecting F and they see F, we finally get this small rise, so they 
find their expectation confirmed, they get a bit, get a bit of a boost, the convergence rates, we find this rise in the use of F. And we find this drop in the use of P, which is very little at all. And this makes sense. For the unmatched phase, however, things look a little bit different. So we don't, we find this decrease in F, because suddenly they're not seeing the F they're expecting, but it doesn't drop to zero. And we're seeing a short rise in V, but it's not reaching the same point as, the, as, as F. And we're not seeing a change in the um, rate of P's. In other words, they're not, in this phase, um, converging um, overall, more or less. They're just restructuring um, the target of their convergence. And we can look, because we can't balance the phases, we look at what happens if you have the matched phase first and then the unmatched phase, or the unmatched phase and the matched phase will ignore the same species. We see these trajectories over time. If you have the matched phase first, you just get this general trend upwards, you get used to the other um, participants using F, it goes up, and then you suddenly get this rude awakening, but suddenly they're not using F anymore, and you get this sudden fall and this increase in V. Whereas if they started with the unmatched phase, where they had their expectations frustrated, we find this drop, this increase in V, and then we see that we, it doesn't really pick up to the same extent in the match films. So we can also finally consider community of success. So we did this fairly simply, mathematically not completely straightforward, to compare the distance between the two lines. So I think we would probably agree that this pair communicated fairly well. The director had a line which looked a lot like the director of the a lot like the line of the follower. This pair did slightly less well. I have no idea what happened. Um, this went on for a little adventure on his own. Um, oh, there on without you the gender. Um, and what we found interestingly, slightly to our surprise, was there was no relationship at all between the community of success and convergence rate. So it doesn't seem to be anything going on uh, between those two. We weren't completely surprised, but we, we thought we might potentially see something, but there's no relationship at all between these two measures. Um, okay, to conclude, so point is people navigate and construct social meaning at the same time as they do a whole bunch of other things, they, as they're constructing linguistic meaning, as they're trying to communicate, as they're trying to navigate these non-linguistic space spaces, complete these non-linguistic tasks. And social meaning here is shaping linguistic form dynamically, and this itself being shaped dynamically. So we get this convergence to expected behavior. So you expect something, they converge to it, even when they haven't observed it yet. And we get this convergence to observed behavior, and we get a boost when these two things are aligned. When they're not aligned, however, we get a slightly more complex picture. So we see a restructuring of the targets and interaction. And overall, over a slightly longer term, we get this dampening of the convergence rate. So it doesn't, when the two things are aligned, we don't get the kind of boost at the end that we might have expected. And we didn't find this evidence that this linguistic convergence contributed or was correlated with um, community of success. Um, so first of all, I just want to stress that this was a collaborative work with uh, Lacey Wade, who is amazing and is currently on the job market. So if anyone uh, would like to offer a job um, I, that works for her, then fantastic. Um, also thanks to Dash Chokla, who uh, did some of the analysis uh, comparing the um, different uh, trajectories around the map. And thanks to uh, many other members of my lab. Jason? Could you look at individual differences in terms yes. of like, a, like what kinds of people are the kinds of people that converge and do well the task? didn't look at it in the sense of trying to, we, so we looked at the sense to see where the people varied and they really vary a lot. Um, what we didn't look at, we didn't do like a battery of um, different tests to look at how people vary on other oh. bases and uh, compare that. Um, this was already a fairly long experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, many of them didn't even complete the final survey, so... <laughs>